Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. We'll be reading 4 through 14. And I'm going to do something a little different tonight, and I'm not going to ask you to stand as I read the scriptures. The first point I want to make is that God is superior over his creation. Look at me in verses 4 through 9. Verse 4 says, Being made so much better than the angels. Christ is indeed the Son. But He is more than that. He is greater than angels. Amen. He is superior over angels. Christ <laughs> obtains a greater name than the angels. Namely, the Son. The, the point of this first half of the verse is that church, listen, we need to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis. Not just once a day, but on a daily basis. Amen. When we wake up in the morning, we should give Christ praise for giving us another day to live. Amen. When we go to work, we need to be exalting the Lord Jesus Christ because He has given us a job so that we can pay our bills, so that we can put food on the table. When we go home after work, when we go home for dinner, we should be giving praise and glory and honor to Jesus Christ because of the provision of food and shelter and our family and our friends. Christ is much better than all created things. He is the same who upholds the universe and sits down at the right hand of the throne. When Jesus Christ came to this earth to sacrificially die for you and me, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death on the cross. This is Philippians chapter 2, 8. Jesus is both fully God and fully man. He became a servant. He was considered the lowest of, of, at the totem pole according to society. And in that sense, he was inferior. But when he died, and when he was resurrected from the grave, he defeated death, and he defeated the grave. And in that way, he is to be exalted on God. Amen. He is crowned glory and honor and power. He is superior over all his created beings, including the angels. But it's life can be difficult at times. Brothers and sisters, we must surrender our concerns and our worries to Christ. We must allow him to take total control of our spiritual reigns, so to speak, and to Take us in the direction that He would have us to go. Now, why is it that when we're going through tough times that we seem to realize that, that Christ is, it's like we seem to forget that Christ is ultimately in control of all things? Why worry? Why get so stressed out when Christ is on your side? One writer put it this way, Nothing transcends the power of God. Whether our difficulty is from Satan, others, self-inflicted, or experienced in the process of our obedience, it is God's prerogative to rearrange, reconstruct, reinterpret, and realign the situation to bring glory and praise to His name. No matter what the situation is that you're going through, and by the way, God knows what you're going through right now. He knows what you will be going through 10 minutes from now, 1 year from now, 20 years from now. Regardless of the situation, we are to give glory and praise to Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is a challenge in and of itself. The author of Hebrews goes on to tell us that as he hath by inheritance, the one who inherits all things is the one who created all things. This is an important reminder.
reminder that all of our possessions belong to Christ. God gave you the ability to work so you can put food on the table. So that you can purchase a vehicle to travel to work. He gave you a home to sleep in. A lawnmower to mow the lawn. The point is, all these assets that you own are given by Christ. He is in control of all things. Just as he can give, also take away. Albert Beavers continues, obtain a more excellent name than that. This is the same Christ who is inscribed with the title Son of God, the Wonderful Counselor, the King of Kings, and so forth. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His is referring to Christ. And his name, Christ, shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son. This is repeated in Acts chapter 13, verse 33. The author of Hebrews continues, This day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. God calls Jesus Christ my son. It is the, the case that angels are called sons of God, at least some suggest in Job chapter 38, verse 7. In Luke chapter 3, verse 38, Adam is called the son of God. But the scriptures do not say that the angels are the father's son or that Adam is the father's son. Only God calls Jesus my son. As we examine the, the storyline of the Bible, we, we learn that there are types of Christ. For example, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, David expressed his passion to go to the temple. But that was not God's plan. For David's son, Solomon, he ended up building the temple. But as we look closer to the meaning of 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, we find that there is a greater significance, which involves a future Davidic promise. This is the coming of the Davidic Messiah, the one who will rule and reign on this earth forever. This is the Son of God, and He is the second day. And this prophecy is ultimately fulfilled. Verse 6 says, and again, when he bringeth in the firstborn into the world. Now, this may have been derived from a passage in the Psalms. Psalm 89, 27 says, also I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. The firstborn is Jesus Christ. He existed before the creation of the world. He came in the form of a human through the Virgin Mary. He said, let all the angels of God worship Him. Jesus Christ is worthy to be worshipped and praised. We are here at Hopewell Baptist Church to worship and sing praises to His name. Amen. God's house. Verse 7. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits. Even the angels are created by God. And his ministers of flame of fire. Now this comes from Psalm 104, verse 4. The angels, they do God's will. And they are companions of the Son of God. And the point to be made is that the angels they have limited functions. The, the flame of fire it can be in reference to, to God's divine judgment being placed over humanity. But the angels have declared a, to Lot in Genesis chapter 19, verse 13, that he will destroy this place. 
just as chapter 19, verse 13 says, For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. This is referring to Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 8 says, But there is a conjunction here, and the fact that the angels are created and are servants of God is in contrast between the angels and the Son of Jesus. And to the Son, he saith, Thy throne of God is forever and ever a sepulcher of righteousness, is the sepulcher of thy kingdom. Now, what is emphasized here is Christ is sovereignty. In verse 9, thou hast loved righteousness. This represents Christ's character. And he hated iniquity. If you love righteousness, then you will hate iniquity. You will hate sin. And the more that we have a passion to serve the Lord and have a love for righteousness that is walking in the path of, of godliness, then our hatred towards sin increases. In other words, as Christians, the the more that we grow closer to the Lord and the more fellowship that we have with Him, we, the more we realize we are like God in the sense that we are made in His image. And when we are able to connect on a daily basis with God by absorbing and allowing the Word of God to soak in our minds, we will strive to maintain fellowship with God. And we will be very careful with the things that we say to people, the words that we use. Folks, there's a constant battle, and it is a spiritual battle that takes place in the mind. And this involves Satan's angels. God's angels, and, and Satan will try to, to lure you into a deceitful trap. It's like a, a fisherman tries to lure a fish to, to bite a hook. We must remain strong in the Word of God. We must memorize the Scriptures and live out the Scriptures. Verse 10 says, Then said Jesus, unto him. This is Matthew uh, chapter 4, verse 10. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou say. We must say, Get behind me, Satan, as Jesus said to Satan himself. Temptation of the Lord. Hebrews continues, Therefore, God, even unto thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness, gladness above thy soul. The anointing of the oil that symbolizes God's blessing and joy that people experience at festivals. And the oil, it, it brings about gladness in a person's life when he or she is anointed. Now, the application to these previous verses. Hebrews is that while God is superior over his creation, we are not superior over other people. In other words, uh, we're not better than our co-workers or our friends or family or even our church members. We are all treated equal in Christ Jesus. In my Sunday school class, I, I, had, a, uh, I had my youth play a game uh, similar to the game Musical Chairs or whatever played that when you were young. But the object of the, the game was, was to grab a chair when the music stops. For, for instance, if there are five youth, then there will be four chairs remaining. And the music is played, and the youth, they, they circle around the chairs in the room, and when the music stops, the youth, they quickly take a seat. And one of the, the youth is left standing without a seat. But what I demonstrated through this activity is that when we do not get a seat, we are reminded of the poor and the hurting who do not have the basic necessities of life, like the food and the water and 
the shelter. And even though these people may not be well off financially, like we may be, we must show love to them, and we must treat them equal in Christ. When we accept this fact that we are all equal in Christ Jesus, we are willing and able to be born. Sometimes God can allow you to experience some difficult times to, to bring you to a state of humility and character is second characteristic is omnipotence. Not only is God superior over his creation, but also he is omnipotent over his creation. Look at the verses 10 through 13. Verse 10 says, And now, Lord, in the beginning hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. The author of Hebrews is basically quoting Genesis chapter 1, which says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It will be in verse 11, they shall perish. The heavens and the earth will eventually perish. That's the bad news. But the good news is that there is a new earth, a heaven, and there is a new earth that will be created. Sin will be wiped away, and we will be introduced to a state of Perfection. We will live in perfect harmony with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is something that we should look forward to. Amen. That we, we can't understand the future things that God has in store for us when the new heavens and the new earth are created. But thou remainest in they shall all wax odes of the garment. These two verses, they, they come from Psalm 102. Look at me in verse 12. And as a vesture shalt thou clothe them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. While the earth and the heavens will clothe up like a scroll, and wear out like a garment that is changed. It's important to realize that God never changes. And what he promises will definitely come to us. When I was a child, I remember singing a song in a small Baptist church in Alabama. And it started out like this. He has got the whole world in his hands. He has everybody in his hands. He has got the little tiny baby in his hands. He has got you and me, brother, in his hands. He has got the whole world in his hands. Amen. The song portrays the omnipotence of God. He is very powerful, who has not only the world in his hands, but also the people in his hands. And that should move us to have a more reverential fear towards God. That means that when, when we mess up spiritually speaking, we need to humble ourselves before God in, in prayer and sincerely ask God to forgive us of our sins. Reverent fear towards God is something I believe that we that is lacking today. And if we had the kind of fear, this kind of fear in our lives on a daily basis, how much stronger would we be spiritually? How careful would we be about what we say to people and even what we say to God? Verse 13 says, But to which of the angels said he at any time? Notice that contrast. Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And the fact that Christ is enemies is his footstool, it demonstrates Christ is victorious over his enemies. He is victorious over the grave. Amen. Mind is very deceitful. And with the barrage of secular information that we are exposed to on a daily basis, with tabloids, through the television commercials, through billboards that you see when you're driving down the road. You need to stand strong in the Lord. 
we need to saturate ourselves in the Word of God constantly. When bad times hit you like a freight train, and you grease the fork in, in, the, in the road, but I should be okay. Do you give up, throw in the towel, or do you press on towards the mark of the calling of the Lord Jesus Christ? You should do the lot. You may be caught in a financial situation right now. And you may be trying, you may be questioning the omnipotence of God. If God can do anything, why can't He resolve my situation? You may ask. Perhaps you have marital problems in your family and tensions are, are escalating. You may say, well, why doesn't God put a stop to these, these, uh, these problems? Why is, it, why is it my wife or why is it my, my husband communicating to me? When we pray about a particular situation, we expect God to answer whatever it is we're praying immediately. But it doesn't work that way. God does not operate under a timetable. He operates under His timetable. Amen. And in accordance to His perfect plan, and in accordance to His perfect will. He knows every detail of your life puzzle. You just have pieces of your life puzzle. Only God has all the puzzles. Pieces. God has a plan for you. And He directs your footsteps in the way that He would have you to go. You're just to trust Him. And understand that He is omnipotent. And that should give us a greater reason to trust Him. The last point I want to make is He is gracious. God is not only superior over His creation, He is not only omnipotent over His creation, but He is gracious to His creation. Verse 14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister? The author of Hebrews is drawing a clear distinction between the angels and Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Angels are messengers that as God dispatches them to this earth, and they deliver a particular message to a particular person. I, I believe that we have guardian angels who protect us from harm. I once oh, heard yes. a story about a pastor's wife who was traveling <clears throat> with her son to Atlanta, to a ball game. And on their way there, they experienced a uh, flat tire. And the, the area that they were in was was it was a really rough area. There apparently was, was a lot of crime there. And they begin they begin to get become frightened. And we probably would too if we were in this situation. And they started to pray. They said, God, God help us here in this situation. We're scared. And I could just I could just them now. Just sort of pleading out to God. God help us. God, this is this is a bad area. While they were praying, a black male who appeared just out of nowhere and he, he did sort of offer to, to change the, the, the tire on the vehicle. The seconds later, a police car police officer exits the vehicle and says, ma'am, is everything okay? And uh, the wife said, well, this is changing my life. And the guy learned that. And the, the time span was about it was just a couple of seconds. You can't change the car in that amount of time. By two to five seconds. And that's that's sort of impossible from a human being, from a human perspective. 
And the conclusion that was drawn is, is that that was an angel. They are servants of God. And though angels do, have the, 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 do not have the privilege to, to sit at the right hand of the Father, they are able to stand in the presence of God. One example is Gabriel in Luke chapter 1, verse 19. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. God's angels are agents sent to minister to the lost. The phrase sent forth it means that the angels are repeatedly sent forth from time to time. This is a sign of God's grace. God has made a way for us to receive salvation. Did you know he, he uses angels to help bring the gospel to the lost? That, that is, that angels are on a mission of service to bring whatever it is that, that God has sent them to do. God, He cares for the oppressed. He cares for the needy. He cares for all of us and He is gracious to us. He's gracious in that He sent His beloved Son to the cross to die for us. And the Bible says, Romans 10, 9 says, if you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead. Finish the sentence, folks. You will be saved. Does that say anything about works? <laughs> no. And yet all of these other religions, they, they teach that you have to work your way to heaven. I have a neighbor who is a Jehovah Witness. And she is pouring in countless amount, uh, number of hours of time, knocking on door after door. She's working her way to heaven. That's not working your way for heaven to heaven is not biblical. The function of angels is ministering spirits. They should stir us in three ways. Number one, write this down. They should stir us to amazement. Actually, there's four ways. When we reflect upon the character of an angel, and when we examine other functions as well as the power angels obtain, we ought to be moved with a sense of amazement. The angels are ministering to redeemed sinners. Number two. It ought to stir us to affection. We ought to be affectionate or, or caring for the redeemed sinners. In other words, we ought to have a heart for ministering to the love for Cleveland about this association event. That gave us an opportunity to share our faith to people on the Greenway yesterday. I believe that we should be more active. I believe that we should go out all throughout the community and continue sharing the gospel. Even though we live in the Bible Belt, there are people who don't go to church. There are people who don't believe in God. They reject God. And so it is very essential that we emphasize evangelism in the community of Cleveland, Tennessee. And we need not to just talk about it, but we need to be exercising it as well. And I believe that is what we're going to do. But God's angels, they take an active role in the salvation process in ministering to the redeemed sinners. And we should be doing this as well by planting the spiritual seed. Number three, it ought to stir us to adoration. We ought to have an adoration or a longing to praise and worship God. Number four, it ought to stir us to assurance of eternal security. Now people all over the world, they invest significant time in trying to diminish 
the character of Christ. Many books have been written about basically dismantling the Bible and giving all kinds of false statements about Christ. And in academic circles, there are theologians who have argued that Christ has limited functions and he is a fictitious character. That is, Christ himself cannot be proven factually or historically, and therefore he is a myth. This is the kind of information that you hear in institutions, even Christian institutions teach. Or those institutions that actually claim a Christian label. A church. We must keep a biblical perspective of who Christ is. And we must not allow the world to persuade us. Amen. And therefore, we are to search the scriptures like the Bereans did. And we are to search the scriptures daily. And we are to strive to imitate Christ. We are to conform ourselves to the image of of Christ, and by seeking to know Christ, you are taking that second step to maturing in your faith and walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Bow with me in prayer. Our God, I just thank you for the opportunity to come here tonight to worship in your house, Lord. God, I just uh, pray that you would just continue to use us as Hope Love Baptist, as members of Hope Love Baptist Church for your glory. And God, as we learned about the fact that you are superior and you are omnipotent, you are gracious to our creation, Lord, that should just give us another reason just to just bow down and worship you. And God, I pray that you would humble us through this. God, I pray that you would just use your word to influence us, and to make us more like you. And God, I pray that we would be active in spreading the gospel all over the world. And that we would tell, tell the people who Jesus really is. That we would present to them the scriptures. And that we would say it's right here in the Bible. This is who Jesus is. Holy Spirit, I pray that you just move in the, the community of Cleveland, Tennessee, changing lives on a daily basis. God, I thank you for your word. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the sunder of the soul and the joints and the marrow and the, 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 the discerner of the, the thoughts, Lord. The point is that your word is powerful and it changes lives. God, I pray that we will continue to walk in your footsteps. That we will continue to seek to know you and 